Good morning, East Coast, West Coast, and to our international audience across the world. My name is Adrian Dan, and on behalf of the ASMBS and the Bariatric Surgical Training Committee, I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Fellows Project Lecture Series. Our morning session will be moderated by myself and a woman who is feared by metabolic disease across the world, Dr. Knorr Jane Spangler. The West Coast session will be moderated by Dr. Matt Martin, Dr. Judy Chen, and Dr. Julianne Lloyd. Of course, every first Friday of the month, we bring the world of bariatric surgical training together for high quality didactics from content experts from across the world. And today is no exception. We have two fantastic speakers um, that I will introduce in just a couple minutes. I'd like to remind everybody to use the Q&A function of the Zoom application in order to ask questions. Um, don't use the chat for that. We go through questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as possible. And also a reminder that there will be a separate Q&A session for the West Coast we broadcast this afternoon. Today, we are privileged to have two great speakers, two prominent leaders in the ASMBS. Um, Dr. Shana Eckhaus is the Associate Director of the Bariatric Center at Washington University in St. Louis uh, Barnes Jewish Hospital, where she is also an Associate Professor of Surgery. She completed MIS Bariatric Fellowship at Duke University and is a very valuable member of our Bariatric Surgical Training Committee. Thank you, Shana, for joining us today. In addition, uh, Dr. Raul Rosenthal is joining us, and Dr. Rosenthal is a man who really does not need much of an introduction in our circles, but he is one of the most prolific leaders in metabolic and bariatric surgery in the entire world. He is the director of bariatric surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and one of the most influential past presidents of our society. Of course, we also know him as the editor-in-chief of SWORD, our society journal. Dr. Rosenthal, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Eckhaus will be covering some of the topics related to the history and the evolution of the sleeve gastrectomy, how we've come across it, and some of the consensus statements of, from over the years that have led to its adoption as a standalone procedure. And Dr. Rosenthal will speak about the outcomes that have made it um, so commonly utilized and how it compares to, to other operations with regards to safety and also resolution of metabolic disease. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Shana Eckhaus and we'll go ahead and share her screen. Shana, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in the Fellows Project. Um, it's been an insight, uh, exciting endeavor. Uh, um, Dr. Dan, it's been fantastic to see you develop this over the last two years. So uh, I, I thank you for your leadership in this and it's an awesome opportunity Team for our fellows. Team thank you. All right. So I'm going to start out the day by talking about the history and the evolution of the sleeve gastrectomy. I get to introduce Dr. Rosenthal in one of the probably the most prolific ways possible. And so I'm excited to see and hear his thoughts as I move through some of our interesting history. So besides talking about the historical roots of the sleeve, I'll talk about the historical roots of the predecessor to the sleeve, um, the duodenal switch, which is a procedure near and dear to my heart, and the BPD, uh, which actually uh, many of my partners uh, study uh, from a basic science perspective with uh, Sam Klein's lab at WashU. Then we'll look at the utilization of the sleeve as a um, quickly as a first step in a stage pre pre uh, procedure, and then kind of the evolution and early technical refinement to a standalone procedure. So uh, let's just jump right into the history. There's a lot of history with bariatric surgery. And as uh, Dr. Portnier liked to say at Duke, we are the redheaded stepchildren of surgery uh, because of the outcomes from our early experiences. Um, because of the work of Dr. Mason, um, we, we really started to uh, grow the field. Um, and I'm skipping ahead and missing all that really important stuff to focus in on the evolution of the sleeve, but you'll hear about that in other lectures. Um, starting today in 1976, we're going to talk about the biliopancreatic diversion, which is a procedure that was really developed in Italy by Scopinaro, where a, a partial gastrectomy is done, where you leave a duodenal stump, and then you create a, a rule limb that's 250 centimeters long with a biliopancreatic limb that's 20 centimeters long. Um, and your common channel is 50 centimeters. And you can see an example or schematic of it uh, on the bottom 
right-hand side of the screen. And Scopinar hypothesized the mechanism of weight reduction was a small size of the stomach, the rapid emptying into the distal intestines, temporary decrease in appetite, and occurrence of dumping syndrome. Um, he uh, published two papers um, early on in his experience in 1979. The first one, um, and they're back to back in the journals of surgery. And the first one was uh, his exper um, experimental study on 12 dogs, demonstrating no complications, weight loss. And then he adjusted his limb lengths in the dogs to try to figure out optimal weight loss. Um, then he, his second paper, just right after that, um, looked at his first 18 patients and followed them for a year. Um, and at six months, they had 24% total body weight loss. And at 12 months, 34% total body weight loss. What I thought was very interesting about his original papers, um, he, uh, which we don't have on, uh, easily available online, you have to get it in print, but he performed liver biopsies at the time of the operation in these patients and then a follow-up one in a year and um, was able to demonstrate improvement in liver morphology at a year. So early improvements in fatty liver disease is how I interpreted that. Pretty cool. Um, in 1996, Scopinaro um, continued his work um, or published more of his work, which I think is um, fantastic as it's in line with Dr. Mason's approach and the, uh, you know, the improved approaches we've had today in data collection and uh, following our patients, but he published his 18 year experience. Um, he had uh, 1,968 patients uh, th not even three years later, he actually published his 21 year experience. Um, but this one showed operative mortality of 0.4% and early complications because of an open surgery being wound dehiscence infections, which are actually pretty low considering the open nature of the procedure, incisional hernias, and intestinal obstructions of less than 2%. Later complications that made this surgery more challenging and why he had adjustments through the years that he talked about in this paper um, were related to marginal ulceration. Um, which is an issue we have with our um, kind of classic gastric bypass as well, um, due to the gastrogenic genostomy, um, uh, protein malnutrition of 7%, leading to re uh, surgical revision only about 1.7% of the time. Um, and the surgically changes he, uh, that he made during that 18 year experience were to adjust for the malnutrition. Uh, and he adjusted the stomach size um, and uh, develop different revisional approaches uh, for malnutrition, either completely uh, or, uh, lengthening the common channels uh, different, in different ways. These are um, from his 18-year uh, data. This is his uh, weight loss um, when he started to adjust the size of the stomach based on patient characteristics, which is the AHS or uh, uh, BPD. Um, when he didn't adjust, he called it the HH, but um, this is year by year, um, kind of how many, and it, ooh, sorry, trying to circle and I didn't do a, a very good job, but ultimately showing a fantastic weight loss um, over the years. And what's really nice is he had the first series in figure two at the bottom of 15-year uh, data on any patients after weight loss surgery, a, a series of 40 of them, and he demonstrated in um, a persistent weight loss with um, his original version uh, where he did not change the size of the stomach or that HHBPD. Um, uh, also during that, in that same paper, and this is why I picked this paper over his 21 year experience, he started to talk about improvements in comorbidity uh, and uh, demonstrated uh, significant improvements in uh, kind of decreased mobility, hypertension, fatty liver disease, uh, venous stasis disease, cholesterol issues, diabetes, uh, was gone hundred percent of the time in, in his patients over 18 years, and then, uh, demonstrated improvements in hyperuricemia and gout. Um, only a few times were they just improved or unchanged. Um, so as we move forward, um, from 1976, we're going to jump 10 years to 1986 when the duodenal switch was developed. So during that 10-year period, uh, Scopinaro kept doing it. It became a very popular surgery worldwide. Um, and uh, Demeester developed a procedure um, using um, uh, the duodenal switch to help with bile reflux in foregut surgery. And uh, uh, Marceau and Hess uh, both uh, 
credited for developing the duodenal switch. I'm going to start with Hess and I'll go to Marceau, although many papers have it flipped. Um, uh, figured out a way to modify the Demeester procedure and Scopinara's procedure for weight loss and modifying it by uh, doing the biliopancreatic diversion uh, type limb lengths. Um, and instead of doing a gastrojejunostomy, which was fraught with the complications of marginal ulceration up to 25%, um, they did a duodenal jejunostomy with the hypothesis of you leave the, pol uh, pol excuse me, the duodenal stump, you get mucin secretion to improve rates of ulceration. In, the, uh, in Hess's procedure, the common channel was measured to be 50 to 100 centimeters, um, but about 10% of the bowel because he actually did this based on the measurements of the whole um, uh, bowel length. And then the alimentary limb would be at about 250 centimeters or more, but a totaling 40% of the total bowel length. They did a sleeve gastrectomy over a 40 French dilator, basically an early version of a bougie. Um, and uh, that was uh, the uh, restrictive procedure. They performed a cholecystectomy. Um, uh, at the same time to decrease the risks of problems with um, uh, complications that can occur. Um, the first duodenal switch uh, in most papers are credited to Dr. Hess in 1979 as a revision actually from a, a transverse gastroplasty. It wasn't done as a primary procedure until 1988. Um, and uh, he tested his theory before doing it as a primary procedure on 29 dogs and then reported um, in 1998 on his first 444 patients. Um, his complications are um, in this table nine here um, from the original paper. And overall, again, fairly uh, low risk. Uh, medical complications of uh, PE and DVT are less than 1%, and other uh, pulmonary complications are also low. Um, splenectomy, incidentally, due to the sleeve gastrectomy dissection happened less than a percent of the time. And then leak happened anywhere about really one to 2% of the time or 0.5 to 2% of the time. Um, and then small bowel complications were also very, very low. Um, his later uh, late complications, again, 7% had malnutrition concerns and issues. And so he would lengthen the, uh, do revisions to help improve uh, kind of the malnutrition, vitamin deficiency, diarrhea that we see with some of these more malabsorptive operations even today. Um, and he lengthened the, com uh, the bowel or lengthened the common channel for patients with low protein or excess weight loss, also for excess diarrhea to decrease the malabsorption. And then in actually uh, uh, seven patients, even with a 50 to 100%, uh, 50 to 100 centimeter common channel and over 250 centimeter root limb, he did have to shorten the common channel due to poor or inadequate weight loss as his defined. Now, when you try to find poor weight loss in his literature, it's hard to, de uh, hard to define. Um, this is looking out um, 108 months on weight loss, um, kind of absolute weight loss is the uh, black line, percent excess weight loss is the open circles of the highest line, and total body weight loss is low. And you can see that in 400 patients with a duodenal switch, it has a very dramatic amount of weight loss, and it's persistent like the biliopancreatic diversion. Um, he also reported on comorbidity improvement, uh, focusing mostly on diabetes and 36 patients off of all insulin uh, to anywhere between two months out from surgery to seven years out from surgery. And then from a lab perspective, notice some iron deficiency and difficulty with phos levels more due to increased bone resorption, but calciums remain stable despite bypassing the duodenum proximal jejunum. Um, you can't talk about Hess without talking about Marceau though. And I feel like we don't talk about him enough uh, with the evolution of the duodenal switch. He published a series in 1998, reviewing his experience with the BPD and then his experience with the DS and comparing the two. He started doing them also in 1979 um, uh, as well, experimenting. Um, but you can see his original BPD on the left from 1984 to 1990, where he does a distal gastrectomy and the gastrojejunostomy. Um, his um, whole alimentary limb length, again, rue limb length is 250 centimeters and he has a, a 50 centimeter common channel. And then in 1990, he switched to doing a more traditional duodenal switch uh, with a sleeve gastrectomy. 
And then he did try two different anastomoses for the duodenal ileostomy, which I'll show you shortly. The big difference in, uh, in these procedures besides the uh, re resection of the stomach was also the length of the common channel, where he lengthened the common channel to uh, about 100 centimeters of the duodenal switch. Uh, after 1990, he changed around the duodenal uh, ileostomy um, and tried a, um, both of them being functional end to end, but um, either an end to side where there was an, a kind of an occlusion of the biliopancreatic limb just by stapling alone versus stapling and dividing after 1992. Um, and ultimately uh, settled in on the duodenal switch where he completely transected um, the duodenum. Um, he published in this uh, data kind of not only questionnaire data, which was interesting uh, on all of his patients, um, and notice when he compared the questionnaires between the BPD and the DS, they had less disturbance in eating habits and bowel habits using the patient reported outcomes from the questionnaire. So an early use of something we use today of PROs um, and then demonstrated similar weight loss with um, uh, between uh, the BPD and the duodenal switch, although maximal weight loss, meaning the most weight loss by any patient was a little higher with the duodenal switch, but that was the only weight loss metric that met significance. And then he looked at the abnormal lab values with the BPD and the duodenal switch. Um, and so with the BPD, um, they saw actually um, uh, more alterations according to Marceau's data in abnormal lab work than uh, post duodenal switch. So as we continue to evolve and learn from the experiences of Marceau and Hassan evolve, uh, Dr. Gagne, um, with uh, many leaders of today, Emma Patterson, Marion uh, Curian, um, started doing the duodenal switch laparoscopically in 1999. And they published a series of 40 patients in 2000. Um, only one patient was aborted uh, for adhesions and the rest were able to be completed laparoscopically anywhere between 210 to 360 minutes. And after about 30 cases uh, is when they hit the 210 minute mark. So demonstrating their improvements in time. Um, the BMI was a fairly broad range, so they had a significant number uh, that it were included with BMIs over 50 and even over 65, and were able to safely do it laparoscopically. They did have major complications that were higher than um, some of the uh, reports of Marceau and Hess with DVT, leak, bleed, and infection, um, um, all adding up to 15%, and then minor complications adding up to about 22%. And so, uh, you know, considering that higher complication rate, uh, Dr. Gagne uh, started uh, um, publishing or presenting on this option of two-stage procedures. And I say publishing and presenting, there's a great paper on doing a two-stage procedure for a gastric bypass in patients with high BMI, because as they continue to evolve and study their, their uh, case series, the major complications went up to 38% uh, and they saw mortality up to up to 6% with patients BMI of over 65 when they isolated that higher BMI from um, the lower BMI population. 33% um, of patients, um, when they looked at the sleeve gastrectomy as a loan, as a bridge or stage to gastric bypass, would lose about 33% of their excess weight at 11 months. Um, and then um, were uh, transitioned to a gastric bypass where then their weight loss would increase to 46% excess weight loss about two and a half months after the second stage. So not even following about one to two years, but demonstrating significant weight loss and improved complication rates. Um, there is a reported uh, reports in the literature of doing a two-stage procedure starting in 2002. I believe it started actually with presentations where there are abstracts and hard to find papers. Um, in 2009, we have a series that was uh, uh, published from Italian surgeons of 87 patients, um, all with patients BMI of over 50, demonstrating safety in the uh, staged approach, starting with the sleeve and then converting to a duodenal switch. Um, and they showed the first stage data uh, where um, their complication rates remained low and then um, their weight loss uh, was uh, pretty significant at two years with the sleeve alone prior to the second stage. And so, and it started to 
let's start talking about the sleeve as a, that first stage is maybe a standalone procedure. Um, before we get to the traditional sleeve, um, there's a, a procedure call, and I'm going to I'm going to butcher the name. So, Dr. Rosenthal, I hope you'll correct me if I get it wrong. But the Magenstrass and Mill procedure that was popularized in the United Kingdom and in Europe, where instead of doing a traditional sleeve where you resect um, the uh, the greater curve of the stomach, you actually do a circular staple fire like you do through with a VBG through and through the uh, stomach near just distal to the incisura and then take a linear cutting staple line uh, in a retrograde manner up to the angle of his, creating a sleeve over a bougie. Uh, Magenstrasse um, means street, leading to an antral mill. And that's the, why it was called the m, &M procedure, uh, where your food and fluids would um, uh, go down the street towards the antral mill, was, which was preserved, where mixing of contents in the stomach would occur and gastric emptying was maintained. One of the big things they were uh, specific about due to maintaining that mill, mill approach was to preserve uh, one of the major terminal branches of the nerve of Latterge. Um, uh, Johnston followed a series of 100 patients from 1992 to 98 and demonstrated uh, not as extreme weight loss as you see with the BPD and DS, but significant weight loss at up to five years out and only had major complications in five patients one with bleeding, three patients with fistula and abscess, which is in my head more of a modern day version of a leak or a, an older version of a leak, now modernly called a leak, and then a splenectomy required due to the dissection near the angle of his. And then we get smart and we start talking about the sleeve gastrectomy alone. Um, and uh, the evolution of the sleeve gastrectomy is really attributed to many surgeons, but Raoul, Raoul Rosenthal being one of the major ones and Dr. Gagne as well. Um, it was first reported as a standalone operation in 2003, where it was a completion, essentially the m, &M procedure where they removed and completely separated the, uh, the greater curve of the stomach, removing over 80 to 90%. Um, it can be considered a first step, like we talked about, uh, for a gastric bypass or a duodenal, duodenal switch in higher BMI or more complex patients. The technique um, that was originally described um, in the uh, first consensus conference was trying to do this laparoscopically, starting our dissection five to 10 centimeters proximal to the pleurus, starting our transection six centimeters proximal to the pleurus, using a 36 to 40 French bougie, and removing all fundus to minimize weight regain, and then of course removing that excluded stomach, that, or ex excised stomach, excuse me. Um, the first review of uh, 15 studies was published uh, by Dr. Agarwal and Heron in 2007 um, to try to start to discuss indications and early experiences. Um, and uh, excess weight loss was anywhere between 33 and 60% um, in these early series. And there were um, over 600 patients that were able to be reported on. Interestingly, uh, the follow-up was anywhere between three months and about two years. And um, bougie size also ranged anywhere between 32 and 50 French, or excuse me, 32 and 60 French. Um, kind of getting into a lot of the evolution, there was a rampant number of papers in the first few years, um, as evidenced by um, that first uh, a review of the literature. And so uh, Gagne um, and Dietl put together a consensus conf or, or consensus summit, and there were what I could find five that were published, there's probably more, um, along with uh, uh, a, a separate uh, consensus conference um, uh, led by Dr. Rosenthal. Uh, but for this first international consensus summit that was done in October of 2007, um, it reviewed the five years of data. It had 10 centers involved up to uh, with 260 patients being reviewed. And from technically reviewing videos and uh, discussing experiences, um, average bougie size was about 37. Um, if you just added them all together and divided them by the numbers, um, the starting average uh, transactions uh, starting point was 5.6 centimeters. And at the time, 65% of patients left surgical drains or 65% uh, of surgeons left uh, drains. Um, they emphasize the role of decreasing ghrelin release and the use of um, uh, by doing this procedure. And it was also discussed as a revisional option for prior bariatric procedures, not only the lap band, but also the vertical banded gastroplasty, which is something I definitely want to ask Dr. Rosenthal about. 
Um, and then the average weight loss at one, two, and three years was 47, 54, and 46 kilograms. And at greater than three years, we did see a drop off to 35 kilograms. Um, and one group noted a very rapid emptying of the stomach based on some basic science studies um, that were discussed. What's really interesting when you read these papers and the, uh, that kind of summarize these consensus summits um, is that they're, they're almost a running commentary of uh, what was discussed. So you get a little bit of an understanding of what every surgeon um, or a center thought during this time. So um, they also reported on complications and overall um, average uh, risk of a leak was noted to be in these even early experiences, 1.6%, uh, so pretty low. Lower leaks or more distal ones were very uncommon. Suture line hemorrhage, also uncommon. Explenic injury, uncommon. Um, reflux was only about 4.7% at the time. Uh, so uh, with this first consent, you know, this boom of procedures coming out and this interest in the sleeve, ASMBS Clinical Issues Committee um, put out a statement, um, a very short, quick three-page uh, three statement reviewing 15 publications on 775 patients with up to three-year follow-up where pre-op BMI was anywhere between 35 and 69. Bougie size, again, very similar to that first review, uh, 32 to 60 French. Excess weight loss, similar to that first review, anywhere between 33 and 83%. And complication rates were anywhere between zero and 24%, including all major and minor complications, and then a very low mortality rate where they recognize that the sleeve gastrectomy may be an option for carefully selected patients undergoing bariatric surgical treatment. And that was the most probably uh, direct statement of let's use this uh, for that time. Uh, and then of course, there's a caveat at the bottom of the consensus statement that this shouldn't be used for legal use, uh, meaning um, not as a reason to for or against this procedure and um, the litigious nature that medicine can be. The second international consensus conference in March of 2009 um, uh, reviewed significantly more cases, over 14,000 sleeve gastrectomies through 106 questionnaires to surgeons. Average bougie size is dropped to 35. Sleeve starts at five centimeters. Dr. Rosenthal reported um, in, um, in the commentary of performing a sleeve over a 38 French bougie at the time. I'm curious what he uses now. The staple line was over sewn with the bougie in place and that a, gastro a gastroscopy was performed preoperatively to rule out hi hiatal hernia for surgical planning. Uh, Marceau, um, who was uh, giving a guest speak, a guest uh, talk during this two day summit, um, our duodenal switch uh, pioneer reported that his experience with sleeve um, that uh, was that leaks were more common if the sleeve was tighter and if there was an hourglass shape, meaning you narrow the incisura. Um, increasing pressurization. And so something we commonly see and discuss today. I mentioned um, an, an Israeli group, excuse me, demonstrated no change in gastric emptying at three months because I thought it was interesting that first paper demonstrates rapid gastric emptying um, through some basic scientist techniques. An Israeli, Israeli group used nuclear medicine and found no difference in gastric emptying from pre-op to post-op um, using nuclear medicine studies as well. So What's really cool is you start to read these, we're learning from our experiences and learning from basic science and um, a better understanding what we're doing. They reported the evolution of weight loss and then complications as well. During the, th uh, the third in 2010, we have over 19,000 cases. You can see bougie size is starting to settle out right around 36 French. Our sleeve starts at 4.8 centimeters. We're starting to talk about reinforcement or um, staple line buttressing and over sewing. Leak rates have dropped a little bit. And then Dr. Rosenthal continues the discussion with gastric emptying, which is why I talked about it, um, uh, that the sleeve does rapidly empty and lead to rapid intestinal translate that he confirmed with GI uh, fluoroscop or fluoroscopic studies, nuclear medicine studies, and then elevated hindgut hormones, um, uh, looking at GLP-1 and neuropeptide YY. And then um, there's also notes and discussions of the importance of the decreased or lack of ghrelin. I include these not to go through, but they also start talking about uh, during this consensus conference, not just talking about how we do it, but what are the mechanisms of action? Why are we doing this? What's the proposed advantages? 
and then the limitations when um, with a sleeve and then causes of leak so we can improve even from a 1.3% risk. Um, the four point, uh, fourth international consensus conference, and while there are many more after this, I'm not going to continue with them because it continues to evolve, um, but you see persistent weight loss because we have more data to follow in 2012 and uh, dropping complication rates where a risk of leak had dropped by this time because of some of these discussions of why leaks occur to 1.1%. Um, and then Dr. Rosenthal's International Sleeve Gastrectomy Expert Panel Consensus Statement came out in 2012 as well, demonstrating uh, 24 center, or including 24 centers, 11 countries, 12,000 sleeves, where the average bougie size right around 37, 38, length of stay for hospitalization at 2.5 days, which is remarkable for the time 10 years ago, a leak rate of less than 1.1% and a reflux rate that is starting to make uh, be more consistent with modern era um, uh, reflux rates. And because of the misperception that the sleeve is technically undemanding, surgeons who do not possess the required experience, discipline, and technical knowledge to avoid serious procedure-related complications might perform it. Meaning we need to be careful. We need to be mindful of the shape that we create. And I think that's something I at least tout to my fellows every day. So um, he, seeing this statement 10 years ago just only further emphasizes some of the work that we're doing today. Um, with the consensus statement, um, they uh, focused on actually developing um, guidelines for indications and contraindications techniques, how to avoid and manage complications, special considerations, and then they even discussed points of no consensus as well. Um, I, I've used this many a times, especially when I was early out on how to approach um, kind of my technique and uh, my reasoning for using surgery uh, or the sleeve as a surgery in patients undergoing bariatric procedures. Um, and kind of as we come through, I'm not going to focus in, but uh, thinking kind of where we've been and where we're going, we continue to optimize technique in different ways. Um, this is using video-based uh, evaluations using the Michigan Collaborative uh, with Dr. Barbin and Dr. Dimmick's group, where we've optimized our technique by actually not only discussing it, but reviewing it critically, um, looking at surgeon-specific data um, and it's led to decreased 30-day uh, overall complications and improvements in technique across the state. Um, and so as far as future directions, I'm actually going to leave that to Dr. Rosenthal's talk more because he's going to continue the evolution as we optimize our sleeve. And what's really important from a future perspective, you have to know your future, you must know your past. And hopefully I gave you a little taste of kind of the evolution that occurred from the 1970s to now and how rapidly the sleeve evolved starting in 2002, 2003 to today. Shana, thank you so much. That was a fantastic review of the history and the evolution of the procedure. And uh, we will move on. That was a perfect segue to Dr. Rosenstahl's portion of the lecture. And I do have to mention Dr. Rosenthal has been known to join meetings on his stationary bike, um, but he's uh, recovering from a, a recent illness and uh, minor illness, and, and he is um, not biking today, so which is great. Thank but, you, thank you. <laughs> uh, more than minor illness, I just got out of my first experience with COVID-19, but here we are. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, uh, Shana. A wonderful overview. Thank you for mentioning my name so many times. I'm honored uh, as I am to participate in this fellow series. Um, a couple of comments uh, to Shana's uh, presentation. Uh, first, starting with the Magenstrasse, which is a German name, which means the street of the stomach. Food travels on the lesser curvature of the stomach. Uh, the greater curvature of the stomach is not where food travels. And when we do the sleeve, we push everything to the lesser curvature, that's all the rapid emptying. That's how we meant, that's how we define if an anastomosis is of a gastrojejunostomy is iso or anisoperistaltic. If you put the efferent limb on the lesser curvature is iso because the lesser curvature of the stomach is the one that mandates where the food travels. It's not the small bowel precisely. So that's one thing and the rapid emptying. Another thing I want to mention regarding outcomes before I get started is that if you look at gastric bypass, this is an operation that has over 50 years of experience, uh, BPDDS, probably 40 years of experience. 
And we're going to compare the outcomes of an adult with a child because a sleeve gastrectomy compared to all other procedures is a child. Uh, if you look at when we start performing sleeve gastrectomy, we are not even really 15 good years uh, since it was really mentioned. And because of what Shana mentioned at the end, which is very important, the sleeve is not an easy operation. It is a simple operation, but it's not an easy operation. Um, because of that perception being so easy, a lot of surgeons start doing it. They just cut the greater curvature of the stomach out, doesn't matter the size, doesn't matter where they start. Uh, they believe that the narrower, the narrower it's going to be, the better it's going to be, which might end up with leaks and reflux. Or they're afraid of the, the leaks and reflux and they do it too big and ends up with failure of weight loss and weight regain. Uh, so that created a lot of uh, problems and it's currently affecting also the data. We cannot compare the outcomes of a gastric bypass done by surgeons for 50 years with a sleeve gastrectomy. And on top of that, People are playing with single incision surgery, with robotics, et cetera, et cetera, which makes it even more questionable. Having said all that, uh, Ed Mason, who I was lucky to count as one of my dear friends, uh, said to me one day, Raul, we need a bariatric procedure that does not cause as much morbidity and does not need as much follow-up as the current ones. He was referring mainly to the gastric bypass that he pioneered. Uh, why? Because he said to me, a lot of marginal ulcers. If you hook up a loop of bowel to the stomach in the lab, you get an ulcer and then you can start playing with PPIs. So marginal ulcers, strictures, internal hernias, dumping syndrome, bowel obstructions, you name it, are one of the problems of the gastric bypass or many of those problems. So when we choose a procedure, when you guys are going to choose a procedure, what are you going to look at? When you choose it for yourself, you look, number one, at safety, efficacy, and durability. I think these are the three main cornerstones, how we choose a procedure for our patients. In the past, the fight of the century was the band. In 2001, you know, everyone wanted to do the band and the band and the bypass. That was the main fight because the VBG, to Shana's question, was an operation that had a lot of complications. Uh, patients developed reflux, the staple line opened up because we didn't have cutters. There were only staplers. So we used to put two staplers, one over the other, and that staple and still opened up and patients started regaining all the way back. But see what happened with the sleeve. In a period of time, I would say of four or five years, it killed everyone. It killed the band and it killed the bypass. A lot of this had to do with patient's preference and also with surgeon's preference because of what I said before. For the patient, it's so important the perception that what they're gonna be doing is safe and they understand. You can draw as much as you want the bypass. You can explain the patient as much as you want about the dumping syndrome and the PYY, et cetera, et cetera. They don't get it. You draw them a sleeve and you say, I make your stomach smaller and I take out the appetite producing cell hormones and they get it, so they like it. And I'm not suggesting because of that, everyone should have a sleeve, but be it as it is in 2022, close to 70% of procedures we do in America are sleeve gastrectomies. So the fight of the century now in America is sleeve versus bypass. So if we compare them when it comes to safety, we published our initial experience at the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. You could see that the sleeve gastrectomy was safer than the gastric bypass with readmits at a lower incidence. The number of readmits was also lower. The number of reoperations, and this is key because when you look at the Stampede trial, I'm gonna mention that later on, it talks about remission of diabetes and hemoglobin A1C. Uh, well, is that how we're gonna measure success in bariatric surgery? Is really just the remission of the comorbidity? We need to keep that balance between helping the patient resolve their current comorbidities, but not creating new ones. Reoperative surgery pays a price. Our leakage rate in primary procedures is probably in the zero point something digits. When we reoperate, it's 10% or above. 
So reoperative surgery pays a price and you can see that reoperations with gastric bypass was higher. This is a systematic review done by, by Stacy showing how sleeve gastrectomy has an acceptable low morbidity, low mortality rate. And looking at our first initial uh, consensus statement that Shana mentioned before, when we look at the sleeve, stricture rate was extremely low, very comparable to the gastric bypass, though the procedure was in its infancy. And stricture rate was 6%, I would say close to the gastric bypass. Why? Because we are failing in making a narrow tube. So it's, it's acceptable that while trying to do a narrow tube, you do it too narrow. With a gastric bypass, when we do our anastomosis, depending what staple size you're gonna use, you might have an, an, a stricture rate of 5%. The problem with the sleeve is that you cannot dilate that. You can dilate the gastrojejunosome, you can dilate the sleeve. And the reflux, as Shana mentioned to us, to up to 13%. This is again the consensus that the first consensus and the fifth consensus that we published with Michelle, that we did together in Canada with Colleen Hutchinson, stricture rate of 2.2%, leakage rate of 2.5%, and ASMBS saying that it was a safe approach as a first stage. So if you're gonna choose a sleeve and you're comparing to the bypass, is it safe? Yes, it is safe. And it's probably the safest procedure we ever had in bariatric surgery since we started operating on severely obese subjects. So then comes the question if it is effective when it comes to weight loss and remission of comorbidities. Again, in our first consensus, and this is experience that we had at the Cleveland Clinic also, you see at 36 months, 12,000 cases, the weight loss was close to 60%. But this is a mixed bag. This is not level one evidence. This is what surgeons that we felt at that time were leaders worldwide will come and report and tell us what they think. But we don't have uh, a rate of, of loss to follow up here. How many of those patients they initially operated are they seeing 36 months later? And this is important. When we look at the consensus in Montreal, 100,000 cases then, mean excess weight loss at five years, 60%, similar to what we saw in 2012. BMI decreased to 29.8%. Failure of weight loss and weight regain, 4.8%. We looked at our series uh, we've done over 2,500 of those now, and we need to re-review our weight loss, but the loss to follow-up is so high that I would say that we can see probably 15% of our patients at five years. Uh, but if you look at eight years, the success rates were pretty high, and we had a very nice excess body weight loss at five years of 51%, pretty much what Stampede is showing us and the BOSS trials are showing us and I'm gonna show you in a second. This is the uh, ASMBS uh, uh, review of multiple studies published uh, 2,248 patients with an excess body weight loss and decreasing BMI of 37.1 to 86%. And this is the BOSS trial. Objectively, he, they compare the outcomes of sleeve versus bypass with one year interval for three years with excellent follow-up. And you see that they're comparable. At three years, the excess body weight loss was comparable percentage-wise about the 70% uh, between the bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. So what, that's, what did Stampede say? Well, if you look at <clears throat> Phil Shower's Stampede trial, you can see here in the left upper corner that hemoglobin A1C was pretty, pretty similar at five years. And if you go down and you look at the left lower quadrant, body mass index, it was better with a gastric bypass than with a sleeve gastrectomy. You have better weight loss with a gastric bypass than with a sleeve gastrectomy. Hemoglobin A1C was better with a bypass than with a sleeve gastrectomy. Both procedures, obviously statistically significantly better than medical treatment. The problem with that study that I always fight Ali and Phil and Stacy whoever gets on, on stage, is they don't talk about complications. 
I mean, we need to talk about morbidity we are creating when doing these operations. It's not about just treating diabetes, which I think is very important. More so, guys, and I, and I ask you to look at the literature. We're going to hear the Mason lecture this year about obesity and cancer. If you are overweight, if you are, if you are obese, the likelihood of you developing cancer is increased by 50%. But if you're morbidly obese and diabetic, it goes up by 200%. This was published by Moore. So yes, it is very important to get diabetes into remission because the likelihood of diabetes, you know, triggering then cancer seems to have a very strong link. So this is the BOSS trial now looking at what really matters, which is also uh, complications. When they adjusted it for multiple comparisons, there was no statistical significance when it comes to BMI and sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, this is what was just published in, uh, in JAMA Surgery. It's not just, but uh, a couple of years ago um, <clears throat> by the group of the PicoriNet. Uh, and they looked also at the very, very large patient population comparing five years uh, diabetes outcomes, sleeve gastrectomy, and gastric bypass. And what are the conclusions? <clears throat> with a very large patient population of 9,710 patients, with a follow-up time of 2.7 years, they found that patients who had a gastric bypass had greater weight loss, not statistically significant, slightly higher type 2 diabetes remission, less type 2 diabetes relapse, and better glycemic control. Is this important? It is, but it is not statistically significant. To me, it doesn't make the cut to tell a patient that is a diabetic at age 30 that she or he should have a gastric bypass because of this study or because of the Stampede trial. Why? Because they're not talking about the complications. Is the sleeve effective and durable when compared to the gastric bypass? The answer is yes. I show you from the BOSS trial and I show you from the Stampede trial. The weight loss, the durability is similar between the one and the other. But the complications in my opinion are what are going to come in and make a difference here in how we make a decision. And obviously, at least in our hands, the complications of sleep gastrectomy are unheard. We had two leaks in 2,500 plus patients. Leak number one, case number seven. Leak number two, case number 2,000 in my hands. And I can tell you something, it raises a big question. How is it possible that when you do this operation after 2,000 times and we adjusted that technique, we had a leak? Uh, we don't know but we had it, um, patient did great. I reoperated on that patient, drained it. We didn't have to convert the patient. Interesting wise, the leak wasn't at the angle of his, but in the middle of the sleeve. But GERD is a problem. And I'm not gonna get into GERD today, Adrian, don't be afraid because I'm sure that you have some other speakers for this. And we can spend half a day talking about reflux. We can spend a full day talking about sleeve and I think between Shane and myself, we're trying to give you somehow a bedrock of what this operation is all about in 2022. Is reflux a contraindication to sleep? I think it's a relative contraindication depending the age of the patient. Because if you have a 75 year old uh, adult that needs a hip replacement uh, and the orthopedic surgeon says, well, you know, you need to lo lose 50 pounds. It's like telling me, go and grow five inches. This patient is not gonna lose 50 pounds because you tell them to do so, and they will not be able to walk and they're gonna have pain. So I would do a sleeve gastrectomy on that patient that has CHF, coronary artery disease, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and probably two bowel obstructions because of C-sections without blinking an eye. And if the reflux gets worse, I put him on PPI. How about Barrett's esophagus? I would never do a sleeve gastrectomy in a young adult with Barrett's esophagus, but I probably would do it again on the 75 year old adult that needs a hip replacement because we know that the likelihood of them developing cancer in Barrett's as long as it's monitored 
it's going to be fine. It's going to be extremely low. And we live in we live in the in the era of poem, guys, uh, where you can fight the gastroenterologists. They tell you, listen, you guys are doing sleep and you're creating reflux. We do poems. Forty percent of patients that get a per oral endoscopic myotomy develop reflux, and they put them on PPIs. That's our solution to the problem. Is that acceptable? The answer, in my opinion, is no. So when we look at reflux in our in our consensus, it was. 12, 13%. At the fifth consensus, it was 2.9%. All this is level four evidence. So it's really, uh, I won't call it garbage, but you know, it's it's not good, good, good data. Uh, but we know that the literature shows that when you do a sleeve gastrectomy, you might create the novel reflux, you can worsen the reflux, and we should be concerned about that. And we should not just do sleeve gastrectomy because the patient wants or because the surgeon likes it or because it seems to be a simple operation. And something for us to discuss, and we continue to discuss in meetings is, should we be doing on every single patient an endoscopy before surgery? And we do it. I think it's very important. The next big question is, should we be doing an EGD on every patient that had a sleeve a year two years and three years after? And the answer is yes. If the patient develops reflux, of course. If they don't, at least do one EGD a year after because they might not perceive that they're having reflux, but they have it and they, and they have esophagitis. And this is very important. We do esophageal cancer. I do esophageal cancer. And most of the people that come to my, our office with esophageal cancer are not the ones that are being surveyed and treated are the ones who were taking Tums and they felt like, you know, I had a little bit of a heartburn, but I, I didn't think it was so important. And that's what I like from the BOSS trial, guys, because the BOSS trial didn't look only at weight loss and BMI. They looked also at complications. And I think this is telling. What did they found out after five years? That the remission of reflux symptoms was seen in 25% of patients with sleep but 60% of patients with gastric bypass. So gastric bypass is the best treatment for patients that develop sleep, but it's not, you know, the panacea. Uh, it is not 100% effective. And some of the patients that come to your office with reflux symptoms and asking for the sleeve, their reflux might go away. And that supports some of the level four evidence studies that we've seen in the literature published, retrospective reviews, small case series, where they say, we did the sleeve gastrectomy and the reflux went away. Because we know that the reflux is not just the hiatal hernia. It is the reception of the stomach, the motility of the esophagus, the competency of the lower esophageal sphincter, the intra-abdominal pressure, all these are factors that will affect if a patient develops reflux or if reflux goes into remission. But symptoms worsen, look at this, in 31% of patients uh, that had a sleeve gastrectomy, but only 6.3% of patients that had gastric bypass. 31.6% of patients who had no GERD at baseline reported the normal reflux. This is very important. This is very important. We need to triage our patients. You guys need to do EGDs on all your patients before you do a sleep. Whereas this was only the case in 10.7% of patients having gastric bypass. I think that this is not reflux per se. I think this is stasis in the gastric bypass patients because of the size of the anastomosis. So pre-existing GERD was found to be significantly better treated by gastric bypass than with sleep. 10% of those who develop the novel reflux are required to be converted to a gastric bypass. And Barrett's esophagus, they found it in 17% of asymptomatic patients. This is also very important and very serious. And we need to take the bull by the horns here. Now we know that this happens in the severely obese subject regardless, with sleeve, without sleeve, with bypass, without bypass. The incidence of hiatal hernias in the severely obese subjects is 38%, much higher than the regular population. So is reflux and so is Barrett's. So doing the sleeve gastrectomy uh, per se 
it's going to worsen this if we are not careful. So I think that in summary, when we compare the outcomes of sleeve gastrectomy with gastric bypass, which should be the comparison we should do in America, since these are the two most popular procedures. And I know that China likes the BPDDS. Some people like the SADI, some other likes the SUSI and the CC. But in all honesty, the bread and butter, the bedrock of America's bariatric surgery is sleeve and gastric bypass. So I think that sleeve has proven to be safe, if not the safest procedure we ever had, to be effective. And it is the procedure of choice by patients. Patients come to your office and they want the sleeve because they understand the operation. And I think this is important. Another important aspect for us to look into is that obesity is a chronic disease and it will recur. So there is no shame that patients come back to your office with weight regain, failure of weight loss. Uh, it's not that we did anything wrong and that we chose, chose the wrong procedure. Obesity is a chronic disease and it's gonna recur. What are you gonna do with a gastric bypass? With a nice, well done gastric bypass if the patient comes to your office and recurs? What I can tell you, can you do with, the, with, with, a, with a gastric sleeve? You can convert it to a SADI, you can convert it to a BPDDS, you can convert it to a gastric bypass. So the door is open for that patient with recurrence to so many other procedures. So it's much simpler and more effective to do that. And again, we can spend a whole day talking about which is the best conversion procedure for a sleeve that failed or experienced weight regain for whatever reason. So bariatric surgery is not always a single shot. Uh, this is the Venus of Milo. I don't know if you guys ever had the opportunity to see this beauty at the Louvre Museum in France. It was done in two pieces. So the Venus of Milo, as you can see here, is not one piece, it's done in two pieces. So if we can do the Venus of Milo in two pieces and end up with such a beauty, bariatric surgery might be the same. We might need a second shot. And I think the sleep gastrectomy gives us a wonderful bedrock to go then for the second shot that the gastric bypass doesn't. Now, is it really our choice which procedure to do in a bariatric patient when they come to the office? Or is it the patient's choice? I don't know, but from what I showed you, the sleeve gastrectomy seems to have the lowest morbidity, but has lower percentage of excess body weight loss, which is important. We need to get the diabetes into remission. We need to get the obesity into remission. They need to lose and keep more than 30% of their excess body weight loss, not 10, 30, so that cancer doesn't increase because 55% of cancer in females in 2017, reported by the CDC and linked to obesity, 55%. So it's important that we get control of that. Or should we recommend the patient a gastric bypass, a BPD, an OAGB, a SADI, whatever you want to do it, where they lose more weight, but they have higher morbidity? So we are now uh, coming back to Ed Mason's big question. Should we be doing a gastric bypass, a sleeve gastrectomy, a SADI? He said we should do the procedure that does require as many reoperations. So in 2014, I was privileged to join Jaime Ponson, Ingwen, John Morton, George and Mallory, and we went to Iowa to visit Ed Mason. And this was our first encounter with Ed Mason, and we asked him, what does he think about the sleeve gastrectomy? This is what he had to say. Allow us to having us here. I started out uh, wanting to develop an operation and it has been ruined by removing most of the stomach, <laughs> which is what I tried to avoid. <laughs> and this is a chance to get it back the way it was supposed to yeah. be. I think you should let everybody know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry if you all like 
to remove the stomach. But <laughs> so you are not happy. You are not happy with a sleeve gastrectomy, Ed. You are not happy with a sleeve gastrectomy. I'm not happy with any ectomy. Okay. The goal of a surgeon <laughs> yeah. is to eliminate surgeon and uh, surgery and at least decrease the complexity of it. Yeah. Why don't we let them all take off their coats? We don't have air conditioning. But I think for the fellows who are on the call, uh, listening to Ed Mason saying that he doesn't like any ectomy uh, is telling. And also when he's saying that the goal of a surgeon is to eliminate surgery and to make it as simple as possible. Uh, I'm not sure if we are there yet to eliminate surgery, but I do believe that the sleeve uh, is as simple as possible when it comes to uh, bariatric intervention. And uh, I still believe in my practice uh, that it's the right, the right choice. We are probably by 60% of our cases being sleeve constructed. So thank you for the opportunity again to present. Well, thank you both so much. I feel like that really was a masterclass in sleeve gastrectomy. Um, and we are open for questions in the Q&A. If anybody has one, I'll go ahead and kick it off. I do want to get Dr. Rosenthal, you mentioned this briefly, but I would love to get both of your take on the adoption of SIPs or Sadie. Um, where do you think it's going to go? How is it going to affect sleeve? Should we be doing it? Should we not be doing it? Um, we're fortunate in North Carolina, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield covers it here. And so we do have the option um, of performing it and have been at Duke um, and have seen pretty good results, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm going to give Shana first, <laughs> first shot. Ladies first. <laughs> Very kind. Um, I, so I'm, I, I'm still a traditionalist, but part of my reason for being a traditionalist and doing a, a traditional duodenal switch is um, if, for at least in Missouri insurance reasons, uh, getting a Sadie or SIPs performed here. Um, I don't have a code and it's a struggle and most insurance has not identified it as an option. So in trying it a couple of times, it's always been denied. Um, and therefore I do a duodenal switch. Now, admittedly, I've taken some of the experience of the Sadie and I have modified my duodenal switch, which makes it harder to code as a duodenal switch. Um, but uh, that's a whole nother lecture series right there, um, is I've lengthened my common channel to be more consistent where my total alimentary ling length rue plus common is similar to that of a Sadie. Um, I have not had any re-operations yet for my duodenal switch. And then if for some reason the ileostomy is gonna be challenging, um, then I can use clinical reasons to stay as a loop DS um, or uh, and stop there. Uh, I, I also have with my obesity medicine board for certification, I've developed this boutique practice of malnourished duodenal switch patients and malnourished Sadie loop DS patients. And so I think it's a fantastic operation done in the right patient. And I think the biggest challenge we have moving forward saying, is it going to take over? I don't think it will because we haven't figured out who that right patient is and how to screen for them ahead of time to where um, we can decrease the malabsorptive diarrhea and vitamin deficiency rates that we can see if these patients aren't counseled um, and followed long-term. Thank you. Dr. Rosenthal, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Kinder. Um So I've been doing surgery for over 30 years, I just turned 63. And um, I always tell my residents and fellows that Nothing happens, nothing good happens when you go below the pylorus. So you have to be an outstanding surgeon uh, to work there and to manage the complications there. Um, so that's my first caveat to the SADI becoming uh, a more popular operation. We're going to pay a price. We're going to see a lot of catastrophes because... Uh, surgeons are going to start doing it, perceiving that it is a better operation and they're going to get into a lot of trouble. That's one thing. One of the things that we learned from the omega loop gastric bypass is that the longer the biliopancreatic limb, the better the weight loss. Really, the OAGB is a poor sleeve with a long biliopancreatic limb. And if you look at the French studies uh, that were published in... in um, 
I'm blanking out now, but it doesn't matter. It, there is one prospective randomized controlled trial in the Lancet uh, that they published comparing OAGB to gastric bypass. The main problem of the OAGB that was done with a 250 centimeter plus biliopancreatic limb was diarrhea, kidneys, but the weight loss was outstanding. What do I do when the sleeve fails? I do a gastric bypass, but I lengthen my biliopancreatic limb. Mm -hmm. I never go beyond 200. What do I do with a gastric bypass when they come with weight regain? I lengthen my biliopancreatic limb. In the past, uh, what, we're trying, what we were trying to do is to narrow the gastrojejunostomy to make the pouch smaller. And Alan Whitgrove used to tell me, Raul, you don't need to fool around with the gastrojejunostomy. It really doesn't matter. Because we were always under the perception that the more restriction, uh, the better it is. And the smaller the gastrojejunostomy, the more restriction they will have. And, and it is not as such. So long story short, I don't think, I agree with Shayna that neither Sadie nor BPDDS will become uh, mainstream. They're gonna continue to be, you know, you know, surgical options that some surgeons will have. Some people will do more, some others will do less. If you go to Dan Cotton's practice, all you're gonna see probably are Sadie's uh, or to Mitch Rosslin's. You know, if you come to my practice, you're gonna see sleeve gastrectomies, classical gastric bypass. And if the patient fails, I will distalize the gastric bypass. So moving uh, on to the next question, somebody is, uh, Dr. Abubak Baker is asking, do you think endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty has a place or is it something that is going to, to come and go? Ladies first. <laughs> oh, I feel like that's a, and so I find, I don't know, when I think about endoscopic bariatric surgery, it's a, it can be a different patient population. There's a not really in the spectrum when you look at the weight loss. Yes, when you can, it's a, the idea of it, you exclude, you're completely tubularizing and excluding the fundus. It's actually doing the sewing version uh, with, with, without dividing of the m and procedure. The m and procedure actually divided it. This doesn't, but it, um, it sews it down and you get reasonable weight loss at one to two years, five plus years out. It, it's still okay. But the challenge is when the stitches break, the fundus is uh, re-engaged and you're going to get the normal, the changes, uh, the GI hormone changes and the lack of restriction. And so long-term, I don't think it has a place. Um, I think of it a lot, quite frankly, as the um, kind of the plications that we used to do with the band, just the endoscopic option. I realize that's truly my opinion based on kind of, you know, using history to inform future and then using the data we have at this time. Um, but that's how I've approached it. I think it's a great procedure with the right counseling. It's just, again, figuring out that patient and being realistic about what the options are gonna look like long-term because we don't know yet. I would add to Shana's excellent comments that when we choose a procedure, as I mentioned in my talk, we look at safety, effectiveness, and durability. And I think all endoscopic procedures meet the first two, uh, or the first one, they're all safe. Uh, I'm not sure how effective they are because if I'm telling you that if you get someone that is 100 pounds overweight to lose 60 pounds or 50 pounds for a period of time of two years, that it's not durable, then I don't think we're doing a good job. So we need to meet all those three criteria. There has to be a balance. And again and again and again, we need to start talking more about obesity and cancer. So the data coming from Dr. Showers, Daniel Shower from Kaiser Permanente, who looked at series of hundreds of thousands of patients on the West Coast, the more they lose, the higher the likelihood is that they're not going to develop cancer. They're going to have a cancer-free survival. So uh, we need to be if we're gonna treat obesity disease, we need to be safe, effective, and durable. Unfortunately, all endoscopic procedures so far have not proven to be as effective and not durable. Agreed. I would just add, I do think ESG has a great place as a temporizing procedure. So for the people who need to lose 
a certain amount of weight to get to another operation or get to something where they're going to be able to lose more weight on their own, I think it potentially, you know, it could be a, a balloon type procedure that could, could get you to the next step. Well, uh, I think that's a really interesting comment. Have you taken any of them down yet? Not yet. That's the challenge that I worry about, right? We have T basically T fasteners and then the adhesions there. So are we limiting our ability in doing a stage because of how it's sutured? I, I pose the question. I've done it once. It was not fun. I guess what I'm saying is other procedures, not bariatric. So if somebody needs to get to a transplant, let's say, um, but I totally agree. I reoperating on them. is not something I'm looking forward to. Well, let me, let me add to, to both your comments. We just did uh, presented at the American uh, Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery, uh, a young man that came to us uh, with an LVAT that were put on ECMO and then had an impeller device. Uh, so the right and the left heart, everything was failing. I did a sleeve gastrectomy on that patient. Uh, he lost about 80 pounds in three months. He was listed, he got a heart, he got transplanted. So if you can do a sleeve gastrectomy, and, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that it's because of me. I think anyone here on this call can do a sleeve gastrectomy on that patient. If we can do a sleeve gastrectomy in a patient on ECMO, LVAD, and Impella and get into a heart transplant, don't tell me you need to do an endoscopic TIF or FIF or whatever it is to get into the transplant. Because at the end of the day, they are going to regain their weight back and the problem with obesity and transplantation is that the fat is going to infiltrate the graft. And it is proven that the heart, the liver, and the kidney, long-term survival, the graft survival in the obese subject is extremely significantly lower than the one that it is not. So we need to keep that obesity under control. Otherwise, the transplant is not going to be you know, durable. I would agree. We're very aggressive here about doing sleep gastrectomy on transplant patients. Um, uh, heart, liver, kidney. Um, the only one we don't is lung for the reflux reasons for, but, um, uh, doing, uh, a series, not only and actually residency, not fellowship, uh, uh, with Carl Byrne at MUSC. We, uh, we did while I was there, I think two or three sleeves. And then I've done a few between, uh, my partner, Chris Egan and I, we've done, I think right, 10 LVADs, uh, or sleeves on LVAD patients, fully anticoagulated, not the ECMO and the impella. We haven't gone that far yet. We just haven't had the opportunity, but if you give me the opportunity, I'll do it. Partly because you do these fully anticoagulated cases on Coumadin and they don't bleed as bad as you're going to think. And they get such fantastic benefits if, uh, with the, if you manage them in combination with uh, cardiology, where at least one or two of the ones that I saw in residency came off the transplant list because their heart improved their weight loss. Now that's not the rule, that's the exception, but otherwise you're getting them, you're changing that LVAD from a destination therapy, meaning that's all they're gonna to get to a bridge to potential future op, um, options. And with the liver, I think we can be more aggressive than we've been uh, previously, uh, realizing with the opportunities to use um, uh, portal checks uh, endoscopically um, with the help of our GI colleagues uh, to kind of, distribute and figure out how severe the portal hypertension is in some of our liver failure patients. And admittedly, it's allowed me to be more aggressive with preoperative sleeve. And then at the same time, we're um, starting to build from the Mayo Clinic experience of doing them at the time and postoperatively as well. Yeah, I think, and just to add, you know, we do have a pretty big experience, Shane, I'm sure you remember from your fellowship of uh, some of the more painful patients at Duke, um, with the transplant folks. And we're also kind of now exploring the concomitant operations. Um, but I will say, I think we're all also sitting in a place where we have a lot of resources and a lot of um, tools at our disposal, but and not everybody has. Um, so these are all things I think we need to kind of think about. Adrian, I think you had one last question to wrap us up. Well, uh, yes, we're kind of running out of time, but I will try to sneak it in there real quick. So looking at the BOSS trial, Raul, and looking at the sleeve pass trial, and even the stampede study, I think we can safely say that the bypass may be slightly 
better with regards to metabolic impact and weight loss, but not statistically better. I think it's within a half a percent uh, weight in the weight loss in the Stampede trial and uh, by about 10 to 15 percent of resolution of diabetes. So my question is, when you have a patient who has failed sleeve gastrectomy, um, does it make sense to say, hey, your next option is the gastric bypass? Do they want to go through a whole new operation with um, with all the potential risks of it for a little bit better? Or is that where the SADI and the DS will come in? And please, Shana, feel free to uh, chime in on that too. I know you do a fair amount of those surgeries. I'm going to let Dr. Rosenthal go first. Since uh, thank you. Well, I would recommend them in my practice, a gastric bypass with a 150 elementary and I do 150 less than 200 centimeters bitter pancreatic limb. That's what I would recommend them. I would not recommend them as savvy. I do both, but admittedly, um, it, there's a lot of counseling and I still, I think that patient selection becomes really important. Um, so the majority of what I'm doing are traditional gastric bypasses and the minority are transitioning into duodenal switch or um, and even less SADI. Um, but in that right patient with meeting him several times, I, I, I will go for the uh, duodenal switch SADI SIPS option. Right. Well, thank you both once again for your expertise and the time and, and all the effort that it takes in putting together such awesome presentations. Um, I know our fellows are um, highly appreciative of everything you've done, and uh, we look forward to having you guys back in the future. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Those were two great talks. Uh, we're at the hour, but we can do 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Uh, looks like I'm joined here by uh, my co-moderator, uh, Julianne Lloyd. Uh, Julie, I'm not sure if you're on the line, but I'll go ahead and ask the, uh, hey, Julie, I'll go ahead and ask the first question um, for uh, Dr. Eckhaus. Great talk on the history uh, of the sleeve and how it developed. So do you think, or in your practice, is there any current role for a planned two-stage procedure? Sleeve bypass, sleeve DS, sleeve SADI. Uh, do, you, do you ever do a planned two-stage procedure anymore? You know, that's a great question. I, I talk about the history of it, right? And the importance of it at the time. I do think with, uh, you know, uh, accredited centers and the follow-up of data and the QI work we do every year, the outcomes continue to improve. They've gotten significantly better just because we follow our own data. I will admit for the most part, I don't plan stage procedures anymore because for the most part, if, I can, if I'm thinking I'm gonna be able to do a duodenal switch, I can do it um, safely on a patient. Um, the only time I um, will abort a duodenal switch when I planned it or a SADI when I planned it is if a patient has uh, nodularity to their liver and concerns for cirrhosis. So I could see that as a potential if I was wrong and you know, the pathology comes back and demonstrates uh, NASH, but no cirrhosis, then I could see going back and, um, and uh, performing potentially a duodenal switch, although um, uh, would require some further workup. And the only other opportunity I think of for truly staging would also be patients who don't do well in the operating room table because their BMI is high, where they maybe they're dropping their oxygen sets, uh, anesthesia is less comfortable due to a cardiac history, that may be an opportunity for staging as well. I will admit that's the exception, not the rule. And for the most part, I'm doing it all at once at this point. I'm curious to hear Dr. Rosenthal's thoughts as well. Yeah, I'm curious too. How about you, Raul? Any role for two stage procedures anymore? Uh, not planned. I would say into the long term, uh, if the patient needs a second procedure, but not definitely planned. I think that we acquired the skills now to do a gastric bypass or a distal gastric bypass in the super, super obese uh, without any problems. So um, the answer is no, no stage procedures. So I thought the talks were excellent. Um, I actually came away with two questions for you guys. Um, it seems like one of them is already in the chat. So I guess I'll start with the other one first. Um, I'm really glad that Dr. Rosenthal brought up the fact that, um, you know, we have to take into consideration what patients want. Um, I personally scope all of my patients before doing surgery on them. But I guess my question for you guys is if a patient presents to you with uh, esophagitis or even Barrett's and is resistant to a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, how do you handle that situation? 
Shayna has always the first shot. Ladies go first. Um, so it's an interesting because I actually I agree with Dr. Rosenthal's comments during his talk. I think it depends on the patient. If they're a younger patient, where the the length of time with potential for development of Barrett's is so high, I don't think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And if you know if if I can't align you know optimizing risks and maximizing benefits for the patient, maybe <laughs> it's not the right time. Um, if they're an older patient over the age of 65 to 70, I think potentially doing a sleeve would be reasonable, but um, before moving forward, not just what I want an endoscopy, <laughs> potentially to help inform decision-making, I think this is where sometimes uh, our foregut testing can be really helpful, manometry and impedance probe testing, so that we can further discuss the reasons why um, a sleeve would not be a good idea, kind of, uh, expanding on the um, just absolute contraindication of Barrett's. Um, we have some data that's recently, well, actually it's not published yet, but we've uh, um, presented at American College of Surgeons demonstrating findings from manometry and impedance pro that help us change decision-making over 17 to 20% of the time. And similarly, when we didn't do manometry and impedance probe, having a so uh, endoscopy do the same thing. And so I think we have strength in endoscopy, but in these really tough patient conversations where you're wanting to do the best thing for the patient, I think sometimes more information um, gathered will help with advocacy and inquiry of the patient when trying to do the best thing for them to maximize benefits and minimize the risks of worsening esophagitis, potentially Barrett's, and then the eventual concern for esophageal cancer. Well, if I can add, I think that everything that Shana said is spot on. Um, what we do is if it's an early LA grade A esophagitis, we will consider doing a sleeve. The patient needs to know the result and know that the esophagitis might go away or it might stay the same or might get worse. If it stays the same or goes away, obviously uh, it's a win-win situation. Uh, if it gets worse, they might need a bypass. That we need to make very clear to the patient. If they have a grade B, C, esophagitis, uh, as Shana said, it needs to be studied and I don't operate on them. Literally, I don't operate on them. I let them know that, you know, uh, they need to find another surgeon that I'm not willing to do any procedure that is gonna worsen their condition. I don't think we need to be taken hostage by any patient, although we are, we bariatric surgeons are passionate about our operations because we see such a huge change and impact uh, that it's difficult to deny the evidence. But uh, I think that we also need to recognize that there is a red line and severe esophagitis in the severely obese subject uh, is a no-no for a sleeve. It's a no-no for a SADI probably too, and it's a no-no mm -hmm. for DPDDS. It is a gastric bypass par excellence. So you're here. here. <laughs> um, okay, if you'll allow me my second question, Matt, um, which is in the chat. Uh, do you consider gastroparesis to be a contraindication for sleep gastrectomy? How do you handle those patients? I actually want to ask Dr. Rosenthal to go first based on the data I presented from the first three consensus conferences, because I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I have my own personal opinion. <coughs> we do a lot of gastroparesis. We do a lot of gastroparesis. Um, we do a lot of entera, we do pyloroplasties. Uh, I tried during my presidency and now as uh, editor-in-chief of SWORD to bring gastroparesis into the bariatric world because not only I think we are the best foregut surgeons in the world, we are the masters of the hiatus, we are the masters of the stomach. Um, I think that gastroparesis belongs to us. And the reason I'm saying that is because nobody can offer a better treatment than we do. Now, having said all that, um, I think the gastric bypass is an ideal treatment for a severely obese subject with gastroparesis. Why? Because you bypass the paralyzed stomach. So there is no air, there is no saliva, there is no food getting there, that stomach collapses. There is no need to do a total gastrectomy. I leave the stomach where it is, it collapses, you just do a bypass, I lose the weight, and things go well. How about sleeve gastrectomy and gastroparesis? 
Julianne, I think you heard it from my talk, comment, making a comment on the Magen uh presentation of Shana. Uh, the street of the stomach is a lesser curvature. And the collected series that have been published, I think one of the main ones is coming from USC, showing how sleeve gastrectomy helps patients with gastroparesis makes a lot of sense. Because if you read the gastroparesis literature, we know that the stomach has also a pacemaker. And it seems like the electrical stimulation of the gastric pacemaker, once it reaches the greater curvature of the stomach, gets totally disorganized. So it is possible that by taking out that greater curvature of the stomach and leaving this narrow gastric tube with a Magenstrasse, which is where, where food usually travels, will help the patient empty much better. So I believe in those results. I do it selectively and not by choice, but by chance. If there is a patient that comes with severe obesity and gastroparesis and wants to sleep, fantastic. Uh, but do I take patients that are, I would say, borderline uh, malnourished with gastroparesis and do a sleeve or a bypass? No, it's last on my choice. I do first, I do Nissen's because they have reflux and Nissen improves gastric emptying. I put a pacemaker for the nausea and I do a pyloroplasty. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, these are all operations that we bariatric surgeons are the best at. Mm -hmm. I, uh, <coughs> Uh, I, I was curious to hear your thoughts just because there's a lot of data to your point about uh, rapid emptying uh, based on that lesser curve um, in kind of the basic science and some translational research and then small series, but we don't have a lot of data in patient outcomes for sleeve or bypass in gastroparesis. I think it's an opportunity for sure. Um, I will say I have not done a sleeve um, on a patient with gastroparesis at this time. However, I also, um, I do a full foregut workup for those patients. And typically, uh, if they're coming in for me for true gastroparesis, um, uh, I do a foregut workup and include, uh, my version of foregut is all four studies, uh, manometry impedance, um, uh, swallow or CT with oral contrast of the chest and abdomen and an endoscopy. And then I add in a nuclear medicine study to grade the gastroparesis to help with um, moving forward. I will admit that I, uh, in my practice, while I was trained to do and do a lot of uh, foregut, I have two of the world's experts in foregut surgery that I work with. And so they do a lot of the enteras uh, between Dr. Brunt and Dr. Awad uh, and the uh, Nissens and uh, foregut surgery and recurrent foregut surgery. So I'm usually operating on them the third or fourth time around um, if I'm considering it for gastroparesis. And at that point, I have yet to have a patient who has had a normal foregut workup with gastroparesis alone. Um, and so I've traditionally done a gastric bypass um, to take care of those patients. If a patient's coming in for primary bariatric surgery and they have gastroparesis, I will also encourage the foregut workup. Um, and at that point, I've also had no normal workups um, to where a sleeve would be reasonable in my, in my head, but I also work with Prakash Gaiwali and I have some of the best um, you know, esophageal testing in the world and very fortunate. All right, great. Um, uh, real quickly, let me just ask each of you, uh, you have uh, your sleeve patient, they've had in inadequate weight loss or significant weight regain. What's your current pr preferred conversion option now or next step? Is it DS, is it Sadie? Is it converting them to a bypass? Why don't we uh, start with you, Raul? I, I do a gastric bypass and I do a biliopancreatic limb of 150 centimeters. Uh, and, and, and just <laughs> curious, why, why, why do you choose that instead of a Sadie Sips or a DS, which seems to be simpler <laughs> since you have to touch the sleeve? Well, we learned from the OAGB and from the Sadie, I can tell you too, that what really matters is the length of the biliopancreatic limb while people lose weight. Uh, we see the Lancet series presented by the French group comparing bypass and OAGB. And really <clears throat> what you see that OAGB loses more weight, uh, but OAGB has more complications with BPs, BP limbs of 200 and plus. That's the number one reason. I think that I don't need to go and work under the pylorus. And I mentioned that on my talk, nothing good happens under the pylorus 
uh, you don't want to be doing duodenal jejunostomies and dealing with leaks there or duodenal stump leaks. These are, these are complications that are life-threatening and there is no need uh, to do bariatric surgery uh, and exposing patients to that kind of situation. Uh, to be honest, I, I do a lot of surgery on the duodenum, on the third and the fourth. You know, I do SMA syndromes. Uh, I take out large adenomas. It's not that I'm afraid. Is remember that we're going to popularize a procedure uh, that is going to be done thousands of times in America by surgeons, and in my opinion, are not all capable uh, to do that operation. Uh, so I don't do it routinely. So, you know, if the patient insists on having a SADI, I send it to Shana or I send it to Kodam or I send it somewhere else. I don't do it. All right. How about you, Shana? <clears throat> so I, of course, have a different take because I like the duty switch and I do more traditional DS than SADI. I will admit I'm still, um, although I'm using more total alimentary limb lengths similar to the SADI where my RU plus common channel equal about um, not about 350 centimeters. I do a 200 centimeter common channel, 150 centimeter rue. Um, that being said, I think irrespective of DS or SADI, um, technically I enjoy doing that operation. It's tough. It Yes, it can get hairy, but if you know what you're doing and you know your planes and you understand the risks and have um, um, the skill set, I think you can do it very safely. I think the challenge that I see and what I deal with, at least in my practice, is that uh, patient selection becomes extremely important because whether it's a SADI or a DS, nutritional deficiencies, malabsorption, diarrhea, and too much weight loss are still a real risk. And that's where I don't think it'll become the primary revisional option because it's not right for everybody. And that patient selection is something we have not figured out yet. And so I still traditionally do more gastric bypass conversions than duodenal switch but it's because I worry about patient selection. And it's not because of the patients who are coming in for weight regain, it's because of the patients that I'm taking care of who've lost, uh, who I'm reversing after a duodenal switch. And the fact that we're not as mindful, I think as a community of a lot of surgeons interested in duodenal switch and interested in SADI, um, but they, while they're great technically, they don't understand the complications that can occur metabolically long-term. And so you gotta be prepared to take care of those patients. Sure. Okay, uh, uh, why don't we go to Dr. Lloyd for the final question. Well, there's one in the chat I thought would be interesting. Um, is there a consensus for bougie size? Uh, what do you guys normally use for doing the sleeve and why? Ladies. Oh, 40. So I trained, <laughs> I trained 36 French. I do 40 French, um, uh, partly because of the uh, series that Hutter put together partly because quite frankly, when I joined my practice, Chris Egan was using a 40 French and to me between a 36 and a 40 French bougie based on data alone, we don't have a lot. So I standardized. And then with Matt Hutter series coming out after that saying, oh, it's, you know, looking at minimizing risks of reflux, minimizing <laughs> risks of leak in large database studies, not clinical studies. Um, it seemed like a very reasonable approach. That's my reasoning. I started with bougie sizes of 38 and I'm sticking to that. And what I tell the fellows is it, the bougie doesn't tell me necessarily the size of the sleeve. It fills the stomach. It gives a feeling to the stomach so that I can build a nice new stomach for the patient. So I don't put my stapler against the bougie. I never do that. I always leave room for mistakes, for misfires. Uh, so I think the bougie size per se doesn't equal more restriction, more weight loss, better operation. Uh, and although the sleeve seems a simple operation, it's very complex. You don't want to narrow the incisor angularis. You don't want to get too close to the, to the fat pattern. You, you don't want to do too narrow of a, of a bougie. You don't want to do too much lateral traction or to rotate the anterior and posterior wall how close you get to the pylorus. You take out the antrum or not, we just published in SWORD. So I remember giving a talk at Tufts, New England, 10, 15 years ago when Scott Shikora invited me to give him rounds and the pediatric surgeon got up and said, well, I heard that all you do is you put that bougie down and you take a staple and you cut on the stomach. And I told him, you know what? It sounds that simple, but it is not. 
uh, and it sounds like all we do is to take out a piece of the stomach, but we do not. We accelerate gastric emptying. We take out the ghrelin producing cell mass. I think we're doing much, much more than that. If we look at Randy Seeley's work on small animals, unfortunately, how we change the bile acids and, <clears throat> and, the, and the receptors and the duodenum. Long, long response to, to a short question, bougie size, 38, but don't get too, too tight to it. <laughs> so just out of curiosity then, are you a proponent of the uh, single staple technique? You know, there's a company that's now coming out with that one shot stable. How do you feel about that? <laughs> you know? I am so excited to try it. It's, uh, uh, it has a, based on this, the way the stapler is built, they encourage it. They have, I think, a 36 French bougie with their set. It's, um, um, I'm curious. I think it's still early, too early to tell. Overall cost, it seems like from a cost perspective, it seems comparable to other laparoscopic staplers. But staple misfires and stapler issues are a real problem that can um, make or break a surgery. And so I, that's where I have not tried it yet, but I look forward to trying it. Um, as that stapler technology evolves, improves, and becomes more consistent with the tried and true um, technologies we have available that have lots of data and lots of cases behind it. That's kind of, I don't know, I like trying new things, but we have to do it with a grain of salt. And I think new staplers are the hardest thing to adopt because a problem is a big deal. Well, I'm highly, highly reluctant uh, against it. Uh, of, or to do that. And I tell you why. Why would you take a straight line and cut a stomach that is, has a bean shape? You want to create a new stomach. You need to have the ability to change directions, to move around that incisor angularis, to stay away from the fat pad. Why do you need a single shot? They're playing, they're playing with a surgeon's mind again. They are playing with the thinking that they're going to make something simpler, uh, like doing an endoscopic sleeve or doing a single incision. Now it's a single shot. I like a single shot sacapa, which is probably the best rum in the world, uh, or you know, or scotch. But I don't like single shot staplers, specifically when you're cutting a new a stomach. I mean. Uh, this is the art of surgery and creating a nice stomach. Uh, and, and, you sh and you travel around that stomach and you keep going up and you turn around and you look, is it too tight? Is it too loose? One shot and it's over. What did I gain with that? How much did I save? If I am the patient, I don't want that. I think you bring up an interesting point, just a comment um, uh, in talking to, uh... Vivek Prashant, who's a big duodenal switch surgeon. Um, I always found it interesting uh, talking to him. Many duodenal switch surgeons worry less about the duodenal ileostomy and ileostomy than they do the shape of the sleeve. You mess up the shape of the stomach and it's much harder to overcome than an anastomotic complication in, the, in that fairly complex surgery. So yep. something just to think about. All right. Well, there, there's still some questions pouring in. Why don't we ask one last question? Since uh, looks like there's still a good number of fellows on the line, um, what what are each of you using for your staple line? Are you using tissue reinforcement, over sewing, uh, etc.? Et and why don't we all tell what we do? And, and I'll just I'll just start. I say when I'm doing a laparoscopic, uh, I now I use the Covidian stapler with the reinforcement strips. When I'm doing a robotic, I don't use reinforcement strips, but I do over sew. The staple line and pecks it to the, the gastrocolic ligament. Um, how about you, Dr. Lloyd? And then we'll have Dr. Eckhouse and Dr. Rosenthal. So on both my lap and robotic cases, I'm still using reinforcement. It does slow me down a lot in a robotic cases because they have to be manually added, but I am just not comfortable with the, hemosta the hemostasis without it. Uh, for my laparoscopic cases, I use a Cudvidian Medtronic stapler, and then I add staple line, uh, staple line reinforcement using seam guard. Um, I like the consistency and uh, manufacturing and the fact of lack of the, I, I don't love the variability of thickness within um, the biologics available personally. 
and the lack of data with the uh, Medtronic available version, personally. That's a personal opinion. I don't have data to support anything I just said um, outside of the TRS. For robotics, I actually, with the Sureform, also attempt, and I say attempt because I, I still struggle with that stapler. I use the Sureform and I'll put staple, uh, seam guard staple line, re staple line reinforcement, but the Sureform struggles with that staple line reinforcement irrespective of staple height green, blue, or white. Well, green or blue are the only two I'm using, or black. Um, and so if I'm concerned about thickness, and unfortunately it's become a little bit of a uh, use good judgment concept based on BMI patient characteristics, because we don't have great data there, um, I will uh, not use the staple line reinforcement, but I will over sew. And uh, kind of further reinforcing my lack of comfort, to be honest with the sure form stapler personally. And when you use your, your single shot, 300 centimeter stapler. Yeah, I haven't I like used it yet. I'm just curious to that. try it, to be honest. I want it. Well, and that's the other reason I won't use it at this point is um, I don't, I, I like staplers with data because the staple misfire, I think is a really big data, a big deal. Um, they have some really good data for over a thousand, I think now 2000 cases, which is fantastic. They don't have staple Ryan reinforcement. And to be honest, hmm. I, I like staple Ryan reinforcement for the hemostatic capabilities. I can over sew it. So when it becomes something for me to try, those are considerations I'll think about. All right. And Dr. Rosenthal, you can tell us all how we should be doing it. Well, we, the also these, we, also, <laughs> we also use the Insignia. I think the, it's the most phenomenal, amazing stapling machine. Uh, we use purple all the way. We don't reinforce, we over sew. And why? You know, case number seven was our first leak. Uh, and we agree we're going to start over sewing with, with Sam Somstein. And we've done it ever since. We feel comfortable with that. It took us another 2,000 cases to have another leak. Um, and uh, I think it fits not only the purpose of the operation, but also keeps the skills of all of us uh, alive. Um, that's what I, you know, I tell the fellows, there are three things you're going to do this year. Pass your boards, learn how to suture, and get a job. So uh, the learning how to suture, it's, it's a sleep gastrectomy. So for them, it's great. Okay. All right. Well, uh, hey, I really want to thank our speakers. Uh, thank my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Lloyd. Uh, thank Dr. Dan uh, for uh, honchoing this, this whole lecture series. I want to thank all the attendees. Um, and uh, everybody have a good day and we will see you for the uh, fellow lecture next month. See you in Dallas. All right. Thank you guys. Oh yeah. And see everyone Thanks. in Dallas. Thank you guys. Have a great weekend. Bye now.